basically what we're going to do today is, is what I wanted to do is sort of fold this up in everything from a, a drop status update to a discussion of El Nino and um, what we thought was going to happen and what really happened and maybe why. And this actually fits completely into the continuum of the discussion of thinking about what might happen next winter and where the science is on that all the way out into the climate projection space. So it all, weather to climate, soup to nuts, um, we're gonna try to do it all today. And I'd really like this to be informal, so if there's something that doesn't make sense at any moment, stop me and I'll try to explain it a little bit more. So this is more of a, a discussion rather than a, a talking at you for about an hour. Okay, so we're gonna start here with this idea of, um, well, what happened? Where are we right now? So we're gonna start here with the job monitors. Anybody look at the job monitor map? Um, sure. It shows up even on the weather channel now which is kind of amazing. It's sort of a standard uh, depiction of drought across the United States. It's, it's developed once a week by a rotating team of authors um, across the US. Um, it's basically an author uh, who's a climatologist in one of these centers who's looking at climate data from across the US and actually then soliciting input from local experts. And, and I try to do my best to contribute um, to Arizona on the Governor's Drought Task Force. We contribute to the depiction of the map here. Sometimes we do better than others. Um, certain weeks are better than others in our depiction. Um, but I feel like we're sort of we're catching up here. What's interesting about this drop map is how it's changed actually over the last year and where I actually thought it would be as I drove up here today. Because as, as we were trading these emails and I thought, late April, man, I bet that birdie's going to be raging. It's not. <laughs> as, as I noticed, and nothing was. The new wasn't, and there was, there was basically no water to be seen as we're up here. And so that's basically what this drought map is saying right here. The California drought certainly has still got its own center of gravity. Um, but interesting enough, um, Arizona, in April of uh, 2015, a year ago, we had this patchwork of, of isolated, very extreme drought from some long term conditions that hadn't really healed up. Um, and some kind of, it just it was a weird patchwork across the state. And uh, California, again, was, was suffering um, through the third year of their four-year drought, or actually it was four-year or four years at that point in time. We're in their fifth year now. Um, but here we are a year later where uh, the slivers that had no drought filled right back in and were back to moderate status. And this little depiction, it's, it's, a, it's a, a fairly complex graph. Let me try to walk you through what's actually happening with this. And I hope that this button is not off, the laser pointer. Okay, laser pointer here. This is all the way back to 2000. This was the very first drop monitor map ever produced. And right off the bat, the first week, Arizona was completely colored in in abnormally dry conditions. So we, we, we don't even have an, we have an aus, inauspicious start in the drop monitor. Here's a very rare period in the uh, drop monitor period. So this is percent of area of Arizona in these different drop categories. And these drop categories, again, are, are here. Everything from uh, dry conditions all the way up to exceptional drought conditions, which should occur once in 50 years. So here we are, no drought, this rare period here from 2000 to 2002. Here's a 2000 drought, which we all know very well. Almost all of Arizona was in um, extreme drought for a period of time. It kind of bounces around here. We have some respite um, in periods of time, a fairly wet period in Arizona, um, 2004 to 2005. Drought comes back in, retreats a bit. And then here's 2011, which was a La Nina year, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Drought creeps back in pretty um, severe across much of the state. We've actually had this sort of downward trend, which has largely been from um, summertime precip and monsoon precip across the state. And I thought that this was going to be us trailing off into this period right here. And I thought we would be drought free by this point in time. And instead, here we are. We've actually crept back up. So that's part of the story as we talk about it today. Okay, so I'm gonna weave around with a lot of maps. I wanna give you some context for, for what's happening. I'll do my best to explain where we're at and what we're talking about here. Okay, so this is April through March of 2016. So it's 12 month total precipitation organized in what we call percentiles or just the rankings in the historical record. This is a historical record of about 115 years. Okay, so as we look across the West, there's this kind of bullseye of above average precip uh, creeps up in the Pacific Northwest. There's some interior uh, below average precip. And then here's this kind of uh, interior Southwest, Southern California below normal. And again, this is April through March. So it's a 
pretty mixed signal of both last spring, the summer, um, this past winter, and then this, this early spring period. So if you look across the west, there's actually this sort of wet stripe through the middle of the, of the Rockies here. Temperatures, um, it's a safe bet. If you want to win bets, um, you bet on above average temperatures. It's always warmer than average. And that's part of the trend that we'll talk about today. Uh, it was above average everywhere in the western US for this 12-month uh, period. And much of Arizona here is in its top 10% of um, annual temperatures or 12 month average temperatures over this period of time. All right, so now we're gonna zoom in a little bit. We're zooming in both in space and time here. This is October through March precipitation. So it uh, takes uh, that six month period, totals it up and then ranks it in every other October through March period in that 115 year record. And how does the state sort of shake out? What's kind of surprising um, is that it was mm, kind of normalish, all right? And this is where, it's, in climate, you actually have to parse things up in different ways depending on what you're trying to get at as far as are we in a drought or not. I'm going to do a little bit more parsing here to show you that this is a kind of an interesting um, pattern that emerged here. Uh, largely near normal, a couple of stripes here slightly above, slightly below, but if we total up that precip, it was, it was fairly uh, mundane for this this period of time. And again, remember, um, El Nino was really telling us that we should have been very wet. So coming up um, near average over this period of time, it's a little disappointing. Temperature-wise, this is also a bit surprising. This is that, again, um, now sort of zooming in um, February and March. So not October through March. Now I'm going to cut off the front of the season in the fall and the early winter, which were actually quite wet and quite cool. And now we're just going to focus on the last couple of months here. So this is just February and March. Uh, February and March were um, in the record, um, well, the record driest would have been in any of these red areas here in the far southwest part of the state. But we're in the bottom 10% of precip totals for the February and March total period in the last 115 years. Okay. So as we're going to talk about this, this was game time for El Nino. And instead, it didn't even show up. And so instead of having even near average or above average is what the expectation was, we ended up coming in in the bottom 10% of driest years for this late winter season, which is also sort of critical time for uh, water resources and snowpack in Arizona. Okay, so sort of segueing into snowpack, and this is where it was a, it was a, it was a very emotional uh, winter and spring for me. I, I just felt like you know, you're rooting for your favorite team and you know it's it's game time and you know we start tracking stuff in october and we get out of the gate and boy it's, it's doing okay and then it's a lull in november november is weird okay well forget it you know they're just el nino's just not a good performer in first quarter play and so you know they're they're a good second quarter team and they typically have these rallies and so you know we just sort of i gave it a lot of pass all the way through october november and then december and then people were started talking to me around the holidays and they said oh no no it's fine you know it's after halftime in the in the winter it'll rally okay and then that was it we had that first week of january right does everybody remember that first week of january it was glorious um it rained um in tucson it rained every day for five days and it was a very very classic el nino run where you get a line of storms across the pacific ocean and they line up and they deliver lots and lots of rain it was, it was it so i thought okay finally showing up it's a little bit late but we'll take it this is the snowpack then at the end of uh, January, it's percent of average for all of these what we call snow telemetry sites um, run by the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. And you can see here that, amazing enough, all the way up to the Pacific Northwest down to the Southwest, here's a couple of our stations, you know, 175% to 200% of average um, for January 19. Okay, so in January, it's early snowpack season, so it's a little bit easy to get inflated grades. It's a little bit easy to get a high percent of average. So 100 would have been that at that date, we had as much snow as we would have expected. So we had twice as much snow as we would have expected in, in late January, right? And that was like, okay, El Nino showed up. Here is April 13th um, snowpack. And we really take grades um, or check snowpack across the west on April 1st, which is typically the peak of snowpack across the west. 
And so as you see here, nobody's doing very well. Um, and largely because the temperatures have been so high. And down here, it's been both temperatures and a complete absence of storm activity um, from uh, late January on. The storm stopped, and then it got exceptionally warm. And it just nuked everything that we had. And so instead of you know, twice of average, we're now down to a quarter to half or zero um, as far as snowpack in April on the southwest. March is really sort of core snowpack season here. April's a little bit late, so these, these definitely uh, trail off in April, but they're pretty dismal numbers across um, much of the West, including um, the upper Colorado, which, interesting enough, it's now starting to snow in the upper basin, and it looks like it may end up getting two, three, four, five more rounds of storms even through um, May. So it's very weird. This happened last year. We had sort of May miracle. There's nothing you want to count on, and it's all of this just sort of crazy, like, makeup cramming. I just see all these student behavior sort of analogies of like, oh, no, I failed the class. I got to go do uh, makeup. So this is our, sort of the climate really behaving poorly, I think, um, from an academic standpoint. Okay, so let's think about this in a longer context. I'm going to do a little bit more of this as we move through the, the talk today. This is the what we call the 48-month standardized precipitation index. And that is just a very fancy way of saying for the 48 months uh, ending in March, which would be four years, if we take that window of time and compare it to all other four-year windows in time uh, of the historical record of the 115 years, so it's the long-term longer um, signal of climate and drought in Arizona. And um, does it tell us if it's unusually dry over that four-year period or unusually wet? So again, it's this kind of weird patchwork across Arizona where I think if you total it up, there's more sort of these orange and yellow colors which suggest drier than average conditions in the long term. All right, so this is one of the things we have to think about in Arizona is that we're coming or going with respect to drought depending on the time scale we're talking about, right? So if we think about longer term, if we think of like the last four years, if the last four years in general were drier than average, that slower evolving climate signal is a drought signal we call a long-term drought signal that typically has its impact on things like trees and water and base flows and streams and things like that. But if an individual season, like a winter or a summer, it doesn't rain and it's below average, that might cause a shorter term impact like vegetation not uh, coming online or, or summer uh, warm season grasses not sprouting. So we can have this thing where it is a wonderful monsoon season in the middle of a long-term drought and the grasses and the ecosystems and the vegetation respond very well to that, but you can still have trees dying in the middle of that situation. So, and then vice versa, we can have um, long-term situation where maybe it's getting wetter and everything is improving in um, stream flows, but you have an extreme short-term drought that causes uh, a fire season to be above average or those warm season grasses and forage not show up. So that's an unusual thing about Arizona is that we have these time scales issues that we have to keep an eye on. And sometimes they sync up with each other, but most of the time they're diverging. And so it's when you say drought in Arizona, you have to say, where and who are we talking about, and what are the impacts that you're thinking about, right? So if you're thinking about water, it's typically longer term evolution of drought conditions. So this obnoxious plot is, is my abomination, my creation, and I, I create these every month, but it's, it's, was, it was an attempt to try to capture this idea of long and short term drought. And so it's basically that same standardized precipitation index, but what I do is I, I calculate it for different regions of Arizona. So these are called climate divisions, and Yavapai County is its own climate division. So we take all the stations in there, we average them together to one number for Yavapai County. It goes back to 1895, and we have monthly precip and temperature. So we take that um, precipitation, we can do everything from a one month, um, which are these values right here, whether or not that particular month was above average or below average, and then we can move that window out in time. So this is very um, high frequency, short term, variability, so is a, is a month wet or dry, is green or brown here, and then up here the window gets longer and longer and longer and smooths things out. So this is, to try to articulate, if we look at any particular point in time, you can get a situation like this, which is, um, this was in prior to 1995 here, 
it was very dry in the short term, but this wet period, um, and this is 92, 93, which I think everybody remembers down here, very, very wet period, um, some record precip down here, that carries through in the system and basically says there's no long-term drop, but there's a short-term drop. So green on top of brown indicates that situation with um, probably better conditions for trees and water resources at that time scale, but not so good for um, vegetation in the short term. And then you move into this period right here where we now have, there's that long-term drought creeping in and it's just very, very persistent as we go through in time here. And a couple of blips here of good conditions short term, but the long term drought is still there. So we haven't had any situation in the last 20 years that has stacked up enough good months to years to solve the long term drought problem. We've had little blips in the short term that have alleviated short term drought, but long term drought has not gone away. So what I was expecting here is you can see the sort of green to white emerging here. There was a little bit of healing in the um, two year time period. The long term drought was still there, and then short term drought comes in and pinches it from the short term. So we both now have this development of long term drought never went away, and short term droughts coming back in, and they'll meet each other. So we've got double drought, right? So that's that's not that's not what we were looking for, and I'll talk a little bit more about what happened. There. Okay, so all right, so El Nino. Okay, I'm going to do a little bit of a, uh, a primer here um, to refresh everybody's mind about what we're expecting here. Okay, so I don't know if anybody heard, but coming out of the gates, uh, we expected more <laughs> out, of, out of the El Nino. To the point where it had been given, you know, monikers of, of Godzilla, and I really like this, I found this on the internet. Uh, the, 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 uh, this is not a scientific classification. I think it should be pursued. Um, I think it's a really nice, uh, a, a nice mix of uh, maybe paleontology of Godzilla were truly dinosaurs or something like that with climate science. But um, one of the climate scientists in California said, this is a Godzilla El Nino. It's going to march ashore and it's just going to wreak havoc. Well, <laughs> sort of. And it, it, it was not, it was a very poorly behaved, not well trained Godzilla. It did kind of, it was Godzilla by all accounts. It was a very strong event, strongest on record by some metrics, but did not behave as though it were the nice uh, domesticated Godzilla who should have given us the, the impacts that we were expected. Should have given us wet conditions across Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico, um, but instead gave Seattle its wettest um, winter on record, which is not supposed to happen during an El Nino, that's a La Nina. And then, um, but the Southeast actually did quite well. Uh, Florida got its wettest, one of its wettest um, winters on record. It was a patchwork across Southeast. And then the um, Texas and um, Louisiana, which are another sort of a prime target for El Nino, not only got it last spring, but got, is getting it again today. And it's, it is largely connected back to the El Nino circulation. So it's, it's been a very, very interesting event. And we are now trying to sort it out in real time because it was a major, major curveball for Arizona. And my whole last 10, 11 years on the road has been saying when El Nino comes, it gets wet. And you know, it didn't. <laughs> so, so I have to rethink, we have to all rethink, well, what does this actually mean? And, our seasonal forecast, all the climate projections on the water precip side, are they a little bit in jeopardy? And, and that's that's like sort of an open question. Okay, so what is El Nino again? All right, so this is a this is a a, a map of um, sea surface temperatures. Those little numbers are degrees Celsius uh, sampled across the, all of the globe here, with um, both satellites and models sort of filling in the data, and those are. Um, degrees Celsius. So as you might expect, and I point this up too, this was in, is in uh, early January, so mid, uh, January 19th, so mid-January. Peak of the El Nino intensity. And I just want to, because it really pops off the screen when we look at it in its full glory here. It's warm near the equator, which is what you'd expect to see, so it's, it doesn't really show up very well on this particular map. But when you do this, when you difference it from average, you now see El Nino pop off the screen, I hope. And what it is, is it's this mass of warm water right here is indeed the strength of our Godzilla El Nino popping off the page. All right, and we'll talk a little bit more. So what does this actually mean and why is that important? Why is this seemingly, these aren't very big numbers. So this is 
two to three to maybe five degrees Celsius above average at this point in time. So that's just, you know, you know, water that's slightly warmer. You might not even notice it if you were to, you know, take one pot of water and the other and try to discern two to three degrees. It has everything to do with where thunderstorms are occurring in the Pacific Ocean. And so if we look at the Pacific Ocean, this is a sort of a modeling exercise that goes through um, time, starts in 2010, ends in uh, last fall, and it's basically to point out, this is from the west side of the basin, so this would all be towards uh, Indonesia and Australia, this is over towards the coast of South America, this is the equator, this is depth with water, and to point out that warm water in the Pacific Ocean is actually a lens of warm water, just like you get in your swimming pool, where it sort of heats up in the first couple of inches, um, because that warm water is baking in the sun, but it's also, as it's uh, warm, it's less dense than the colder water below it, so it floats on top. So we get this thing we call a thermocline. And this little lens of warm water gets pushed around by the wind patterns. And so what ended up happening over the last couple of years, and in particular the last basically 18 to 24 months, you see this warm water building up here slosh back towards, so these uh, red colors by the end sort of fill in towards the east, all right? And then that's where you get this red blob emerge because it's now much warmer than it normally is. And then as I said, thunderstorms follow warm water. So they actually, they, where they're supposed to be here, they now follow the warm water to the central and eastern Pacific. And as they do that, the whole circulation of the globe reorganizes around where these thunderstorms are. So that's what this little graphic here is, is uh, basically um, trying to articulate. Equator, warmer than average, colder than average water. Here is that um, cluster of thunderstorms that should be here, is now wandering over here, and what goes up in that in the atmosphere has to come down, so we get these closed circulations, transverse circulations in the atmosphere. This is called the um, Walker circulation. This rising air here spreads out and sinks in the Atlantic Basin and sinks in the far West Pacific. So what was the hurricane season like last um, spring and summer in the Atlantic? Anybody remember? It was close to zero. It was record low. And so that's largely determined because sinking air squashes any of those storms trying to form, to form hurricanes. So it killed the El Nino hurricane season. We had a record high um, hurricane season, tropical storm season in the East Pacific, which was largely because we had lots of very, very fertile ground for storms to develop warm water, low shear in the atmosphere, rising air. It was just the perfect, perfect ground that led into um, quite a nice summer. Um, it helped spur on monsoon activity. And into the fall helped our really good October. And then things kind of went off the rails um, for the rest of the season, even though this circulation was in full swing all the way, and you can even see it till today. Okay, so when we have that, when we have that circulation, what it does to the storm track in North America is it typically causes the jet stream to split um, and move up into Canada. This is the polar jet. And then we have this, what we call um, a Pacific subtropical jet is stronger than average, and it delivers, it should, deliver us a torrent of storms over months. It'll come and go, but it should, on average, give us a higher frequency of storms and more storms, delivering more precinct. So this um, pattern was there, but it was slightly tweaked, all right? And this subtropical jet um, today is screaming through, it's actually down here, right there, and it's going right over Houston, which is why Houston is flooding out um, today. And it's also why Texas flooded out last um, May as well, because of the same pattern. Because El Nino was even in, why in we control at that point in time. Take away Mike's tool. Okay, so globally, um, what do El Ninos do? You can see here's that, that typical impact down here, wet and cool across the southern tier states. It's typically warm here because the jet stream goes like this. Um, remember, this is sinking air here. Thank you. So it typically dries out Indonesia. Indonesia Good. catches Thanks, on fire. Um, the tropical uh, forests will, will, the jungles will catch on fire because it gets so dry and, and Australia can have um, impacts there and we can have um, drought episodes in Africa. All of that came true um, across the globe. 
There were very, very predictable and regular impacts that followed this map, except here. Um, it didn't pan out in our area. Um, and that is still, to this day, watching the discussions, reading the literature, it's, we don't know. And, and this is gonna be a really active area of research going forward. Okay, so how big was this event? So this is a nice graph that I, I really like here. This goes back to 1950. It's monthly, we call it Oceanic Nino Index. It's simply how warm is that water in the middle of the Pacific above average or below average, okay? So if it's zero, it's what you'd expect. If it's um, above average, these are El Nino events, and then this is the, the um, high bar here of a strong El Nino event, and this is the bar down here for a strong La Nina event. So let's look back to some of our more, re more recent events here. Um, this is uh, the La Nina event of 98-99 that's largely responsible for the beginning of our drought period. This was the last um, moderate event was in 2009-2010, which was a, a fairly decent winter. Uh, Five Step got 10 feet of snow that particular winter, but it crashed like that, all melted, and then Five Step caught on fire. So it was a very typical, in Arizona, you can't win. You can have this amazing snowpack, and then a month later, you can still catch on fire. It's, it's the, I, I'm not from Arizona, so I'm still sort of getting my head around, how does this stuff happen? It just doesn't make any sense at all, but it's so Arizona. Um, here is the 2015-16 event. You can see it right here. Look at its company, 97, 98. It nudged out 82, 83, and eclipsed 72, 73. These were the, the, the big, big Godzillas of the past, right? These were the events that we, we said, it is going to reach the magnitude of these past events. And if we look at these past events, what have these past events done for Arizona and Southern California? They've wreaked havoc. They've created amazing amounts of water and precipitation and snowpack across the Southwest largely have left the Pacific Northwest high and dry. Um, you can look back in the paleo record and you can see that La Niña's uh, largely control fires over long periods of time. So the, the expected impact was a very predictable, what we thought was predictable, um, expected response of it getting wet here because it was in a very, very, again, it's small numbers, but it was in rare company. All right. so. How does El Nino work again? It's, it's that same idea of that graphic I showed you with the split of the jet stream. I just want to show you in a little more um, quantitative terms here. Okay, so this is what the jet stream typically looks like. This is um, Japan, uh, China. This is the International Dateline of the Pacific. This is the equator down here. This is the coast of uh, North America right here. And these uh, colors right here indicate the intensity of the wind speed. Okay, so the jet stream about 30, 35,000 feet. If you're flying from uh, California to uh, China, you're gonna try to not get in the jet stream and your flight's gonna be longer, but if you're coming back, your pilot's gonna put the plane in the jet stream and is gonna sail on you know, a, a 200 mile an hour wind and you're gonna save a bunch of fuel and you're gonna get home an hour earlier. Okay, so we know the jet stream. We know, that we know this very, very well and um, Typically, what La Nina and El Nino do to the jet stream is they change the position in the winter of this jet stream. And the jet stream is important to us because it steers storms. It is the storm track driver. So if the jet stream is near you and it's pointed at you, it typically means that it's gonna, it's gonna like a bowling ball, it's gonna roll some storms your way and you're gonna get repeated um, precipitation events. Okay, so you can see here that um, typically the jet stream, on average, this is climate now, so it's averaging over December through February period. Uh, is a little bit retracted here and sort of dumps storms um, this part and then they can kind of wander off to the northwest, they can wander off towards us, um, but largely it becomes sort of roll of the dice, luck of the draw, how weather is playing out in the typical winter. Okay, so La Nina events are interesting because the jet stream has this little flip to it right past the international date line. And this little flip um, pretty regularly steers storms towards the Pacific Northwest and away from us. So when we get into a La Nina winter, we look at these jet stream patterns, the storms get steered away from us, right? And we look at the drought periods of the last 20 years, 100 years, even to the tree ring record, the La Ninas are very, very predictable. Um, they're very reliable indicators of the winter being dry, okay? So that's what you get during a La Nina. Okay, so in El Nino, look at this jet stream compared to average. It gets big and muscular and extends across the Pacific Ocean and 
tends to have a flip towards the south now and is pointed right at Southern California on average. Okay, so this this is Feb this is 1998 on them. You can see this storm track is fantastic for lining up storms, and pointing them at the southwest, and then delivering them in repeated fashion. Okay, so that's what happened in 1998. That's what happened. This is the jet stream map of that first week of January, which gave me hope that okay, El Nino finally showed up and it's ready to go and it delivered. It's going to deliver us what we um, what we were expecting. Okay, so this is actually what happened with the jet stream, and it's kind of interesting. So this is December through February, ending in 2016. So it's this past winter. It's a little weird and it's very subtle. It kind of looks like this. But it's got a couple of, of um, idiosyncrasies to it. It's got this little bit of a very subtle wave to the north here, and then it kind of fades out here. It's a bit weaker than normal, and then it um, strengthens uh, just past us. So this little weakness in the jet stream that is not here in '98 was all of our problem. And what ended up happening was that these storms got dumped right here, and they flipped towards the northwest, which is why. Seattle ends up having the wettest uh, winter on record, and we end up waiting, waiting, waiting. Every week, I'd look at the forecast and say, well, it'll show up next week. How many people, by the, you know, by the end of March, were like, they just stopped, they just shook their head at me. Because I just was, I was in, you know, I was repeating this, this line that they knew was never gonna come true. I, I just, I gave up, I, I wouldn't give up to the very end. And I'm, I'm admitting, defeat, admitting defeat now. Um, but this pattern right here is unusual. And that's what we're going to end up doing, I think, in the quantum science community over the next years, is trying to figure this out. How will we do that? We'll have to use computer models to disentangle uh, all the little pieces of this jet stream pattern and figure out what went wrong. And um, I don't know. Uh, I think that there's some, there's some culprits out there. Some culprits are is that the Indian Ocean was much, much warmer than it has ever been, at least in the recorded record. Um, and all of the jet stream waves in the wintertime emerge from the tropics. So I bet the culprit is somewhere in the tropics and it could be associated with all this warming um, we've seen sea surface temperature wide uh, across the planet. Okay, so I wasn't crazy in thinking that it was gonna be a wet winter. Um, if we look at past wet winters, this is for um, Yavapai yeah, County. This is all, this is back through 1950, all the way through 2016. This is, the blues are La Nina winters. The greens are when uh, it was neutral or neither La Nina or El Nino were present. And the reds were what we would classify as El Nino. So same as we were classifying with that previous um, time series graph. Okay, so if you had no other information, and thankfully we do, we have computer models and, and um, other research, but if you had this, this information, what would you think um, the precip might end up being in total from October through March for Yavapai County? Give me a number. Make a forecast. <laughs> ten. Okay, so let's throw so let's throw ten up there. Okay, so you you'd play the you you play the odds, which would say on average El Ninos give us about ten inches. So you, you're hedging a little bit. That's good. That's probably a, that's probably a safer bet. I went crazy and thought. Well, shoot, we're going to be up here because our past two big ones, look at these are, these are our strong ones right here. Again, small numbers, statistics, you're you know, often fooled by not having very much data, but I fell hook, line, and sinker for it. Um, here's our strong events. So I thought, well, just statistically, maybe our new event would hang out with these other brother uh, El Ninos here. Okay, anybody else? Well, you know what happened, right? So it's not like, this, we did this in January. I, I would have you know, drawn you along and we would have all been, long, all been wrong. So there's 2016. So, you know, it's a new, uh, a new notch in the, in the scatter plot here. And the signal gets much, much more noisy rather than clear, all right? We have a lot to learn from this event. It's clearly an outlier. I hope. I hope then, so if you think about this, what if we had a thousand years of data and we put the scatter plot together? The hope would be that they all those thousand points sort of stack up here, and this is indeed an outlier, and the hope is, is not that there's just points all over the place here, right? This, this, not just statistics, but the dynamics and the forecast models really do indicate that 
with a thousand years of data, you should have some organization like this. So this is probably an outlier, probably an outlier. But again, we've got a lot of work to do to try to figure this out. Okay, so some more plots here. I just wanted to show you. I made these little baseball cards of stations here, and I just wanted to show you that one of the interesting things about this um, evolution of precip. So this is October through, and it's going to end in May 31st. And this is this is um, present. It's updating uh, every day. This is for for Prescott. Is that um, I have these little sort of Gantt charts to show the central tendency of where do you usually hit half of the, the annual total precipitation? On average, in the October through May period, Prescott usually ends up getting it right about the middle of January. So if you were to have a normal sort of average accumulation of precip from October 1st through the end of May, you end up hitting it about here. Well, what we ended up having happen was that there was so much precip in October that it really pulled the whole center of gravity of this season too early and then it dried out so that's where we were looking at that october through march map it looked actually near average well that's a little bit misleading because all the precip ended up happening in the first three weeks of october so it doesn't actually tell you the whole evolution of the season and we end up getting these things where we get these steps where these were long breaks in precip um, that ended up really drying out um, these areas okay this is flagstaff um, this is how flagstaff looks you can see it's even earlier here. So Flagstaff hit its half of its total precipitation this season, hit it in the first week of November. So that's quite a bit off target um, from when it would actually hit it in January. So very, very front weighted in the season. And then what do those past big El Nino events look like on the same baseball card? This is um, 97, 98 El Nino, which is kind of interesting. Uh, as you get sort of further north in the state, the El Nino signal kind of trailed off. So 97, 98 was not all that spectacular, but it was amazing. It had 62 days of precipitation, came in at above average, um, kind of tailed behind here, but ended up finishing near average here. Um, so just a lot of events uh, going forward. Uh, I guess I thought 82, 83. Um, so in, in comparison, um, Oh, there it was. There was 82, 83. So that was 82, 83. So that's what a big El Nino event looks like for northern Arizona. Uh, you can see here that 70 days of precip, 21 inches of precip, so quite a bit above average. So it just basically, and look at this clustering of events here too. So February, that was that kind of like our January run. We look back to Flagstaff. So this is that classic El Nino run of precip right here. It's that big step up in total precip. In 83, we had you know, a run of that that lasted from mid-January out through mid-February. It happened again in March, a little bit of a break. Happened again in late March, and then it even did it again in April. So that was, we were more thinking, that's more the ilk of El Nino uh, expectations we thought would come out of this event, and it, it clearly has not. Okay, so the snow part of it, I was looking through your, your newsletter that, was, that came out this week, and I saw that really nice uh, article on, from the Desert Sun on snow across the, the west, which is, um, we'll talk a little bit more about today, really part of the story here. This is snowpack from um, two sites. This is up on um, the San Francisco peaks, and this is one uh, north of here. Uh, this is the White Horse Lake one is here. This is um, up on, uh, Snowslide Canyon up in the Humphreys. And this is the snow water equivalent in inches uh, that we had, let's see, what was this year? This blue line right here. So off to a good start on average, right in um, December, and then really trailed off here. But you can see here down a little lower elevation, the snowpack up, and then the crash about a month earlier than you'd expect to see. So losing that snowpack way out of, out of time. All right, um, sort of quickly move through a couple of these other slides and I'll just look about long-term trends and skip those. So now the discussion um, really shifts to what's next. And what's next is um, La Nina. And what typically follows strong El Nino events are La Nina events. Um, just dynamically, there's all that warm water ends up getting exhausted, and La Nina, which is below average sea surface temperatures, fills back in. Okay, does anybody remember what's a La Nina winter mean for Arizona? If you can remember our scatter plot back there, those blue dots were all below average. And there are very few surprise 
La Nina events, at least in the historical record. I'm up for anything now. Does La Nina mean wet? Sure, okay, I'll take it. I mean, but dynamically, La Nina would steer the storm track to the Pacific Northwest, so the Pacific Northwest ends up now lining up for two wet winters in a row, where we now lined up for two dry winters in a row with this La Nina forecast. So these bar plots indicate the probability of La Nina conditions uh, developing, so they're up over 70% for next um, spring and, and winter, no, sorry, next fall and winter. And then the seasonal forecast, so this is January, February, March, a year from now, the Climate Prediction Center just taking this signal. Again, wrong this year, but I think we all sort of fell for it because all the guidance was pointing towards wet conditions. La Nina is a bit more reliable in telling us that next winter would be below average. And that's what these, this brown um, plot here is suggesting is that in this January, February, March period, the core of our, our precip season, um, we're leaning towards dry conditions at this point in time. Subject to change, but this time scale, given the past of these uh, La Nina events forming after El Nino, this is a fairly, um, it's probably a pretty good forecast at this point. But man, I would like to be wrong. I, I was so bummed to be wrong in the wrong direction because I, I felt like I was, you know, giving a message of hope to Arizona with this El Nino coming in. We can't even, can't even squeak it out in an El Nino event here. Okay, so let's put some of this into context. Um, this is for Yavapai County, 1900 through 2015 annual total precipitation. And we know that Arizona has a very, very variable climate. Uh, we can swing wildly above and below this black line right here. Uh, this is average for the whole county going forward. This is there are some more recent drought conditions we, we've been dealing with. Um, we can rescale this um, in that same standardized precipitation index. So those red bars indicate dry years, blue bars indicate wet years. So this is our most recent drought. And of, since 2000, 10 of the last 16 years have been uh, below average. So this is, and you can really start to stare at this graph. You can see 1989 was a very dry year, but the stacking up of below average years really starts about 1996, and then extends forward a couple of wet years or near average years in between, but largely we've been below average since that point in time. So we're in a decades long drought at this point. At the same time, it's definitely getting warmer. So this is the long-term temperature trend. So 14 of the last 16 years uh, in Yavapai County, the uh, annual average temperature has been above average. And we're squeaking out here, and we have runs of these years um, now sort of squishing together, saying we're persistently above average, which is why even on those seasonal forecasts, the seasonal forecasters use trend to make forecasts. So it's not just in sort of climate change science we're using this, we're using it in operational forecasting, saying that the probability of next summer being above average is very, very good because the last 14 have been. So just playing trend by itself is giving us reliable results um, in saying that this is not very variable, it's persistently warmer than average now. What if we take these two things and put them together, if we take the above average temperatures and the below average precipitation, you can envision that warmer years are also years that you have more evapotranspiration, more stress in water resources, more stress in vegetation. You get something that we call the standardized precipitation um, evapotranspiration index. So if it's warm and dry, you get a, a, a much deeper um, bar here pointing towards negative. So you can see here that the most recent drought is actually quite a bit more intense than even the 50s drought because it's warmer. So that, that additive effect of increasing temperatures and dry conditions um, is presumably increasing drought impacts and stress on resources. And we can even see in this plot, this is, I just pulled this plot out, so those are two of the um, largest uh, wildfires in Arizona history sort of aligning themselves with both um, these very, very deep drought years and warm years. Okay, so moving into, so what, so we've got this sort of context for um, recent drought, just drought conditions coming back, um, temperatures continue to warm, historic variability really points to Arizona being dry. So we live in a, a dry place. Um, where does climate science suggest we're going now in using climate projections, okay? So climate projections, which I'm gonna pull right here from the, um, 
the Southwest Climate Change Assessment Report, which was uh, published a couple, excuse me, a couple years ago in conjunction with the National Climate Assessment, is sort of the state-of-the-art synthesis of these climate projections and the climate science surrounding um, the Southwest. So this resource is online and, and very, very approachable. And the way that the, the regional assessments were put together is they were very grand regions. And so when I look at these results, it's the grand Southwest. It's a, a little bit stretch, I think, to include California and the Southwest, but they kind of muscled their way into it. We'll have to, have to get it to them. So it's the four corner states, including Nevada and California. But largely the pattern in any one of those states would be, would be very similar. Okay, so it's not surprising probably that what the projections say about the Southwest is that um, it's going to get warmer. And we'll talk a little bit more about this when we focus on this, this sort of temperature. So this is um, multi-decade plots. This is 2021 through 2050. So it's taking um, that multi-decade period for the whole Southwest and then looking at the climate projections um, for this region and then breaking them up by season and then differencing them from the long-term average down here. So what you notice here is that every climate projection is positive. So there are no models suggesting any cooling in coming decades or below average temperatures. And by season, you can see a little bit of a breakout here. And notice that summer is warming faster than any of the other seasons. And the ranges here, as we get out to sort of middle century and late century, end up seven, eight, nine, 10 degrees on average warmer for annual average temperatures, right? So we know 10 degrees on a daily time step. So if tomorrow's 10 degrees warmer than today, you'd notice it. So think about the annual average temperature from one year to the next being 10 degrees warmer is substantial, right? Our variability right now is on the order of a couple degrees from year to year. This would certainly stand out when you'd notice it on going forward. So the precip, which is very interesting, and I think it's I think it's tied back to it. yes. Sorry. Does the diurnal variation increase also? Well, it's a very good question. Um, so does the diurnal variation increase also? Okay, so <clears throat> diurnal variation would be the variation from the nighttime minimum temperature to the daytime um, uh, maximum temperature. Um, it would depend on a couple of things. Uh, if it's humid and there's increasing humidity, then the diurnal range shrinks. And so it doesn't cool off as, at night as much as it would. Um, and then um, if it's drier and you end up having very dry springs, you can have very, very large diurnal temperature swings. The models aren't good enough to sort of tease that element out of it. They'll just move the whole sort of annual average up. But the daily scale variability is still um, quite noisy uh, going forward. This winter has been, was very interesting in Tucson. It was probably up here as well. But our diurnal temperature swings in February and March were enormous. Um, they were the biggest that I had seen in the last 15 years. We were cooling off at night, amazingly, because the sun is very low at that time of year. But the daytime temps were, were soaring because we had this very strong high pressure over us. And so we had, and it was very dry. That was the other key is we had very, very, the dew points were very, very low. That's your classic desert climate. You know, these very, very large swings. If it's humid, though, you know this in the middle of the monsoon, it does not cool off overnight, and you end up having this warm, but everything is from daytime high to the nighttime min is very small in that very low. So very good question. Okay, so on the precip side, and again, I think this is tied back to our, our uncertainty, even on the seasonal scale with El Nino, is this is zero, meaning no change, and our models are still straddling zero for the Southwest, right? We're having a terrible time of discerning changes going forward in precipitation. What you do see, though, is in the wintertime, um, this, I'm sorry, this is actually spring. Springtime seems to start to get drier and separate away from zero um, in about 10 to 20% drier. The other seasons sort of are in a mess of noise around that. So, and again, I think this is, this is uncertainty from everything of the, um, how the monsoon might change in the future. Very, very unclear with the models. <coughs> how El Nino may change and how its, how its impacts in the Southwest may change. Um, give us this, this spread in um, the model results going forward. So warming Southwest is very, very, we're already seeing it. Um, the precip changes, um, as they are so complicated and our interannual variability is so high, going forward, our projections still are not teasing out, I think, a real usable signal going forward. So it's a bit of a question mark going forward. Okay, but 
warming temperatures by themselves tell you a lot about how future climate may look across the Southwest. And in particular, that, that article that uh, you posted on your newsletter has this really nicely illustrated, is that um, warming temperatures um, reduce snowpack. Very, very simple. The largest reservoir system in the western US is snowpack. It's not dams. We use dams to manage snowpack. And if snowpack isn't there, there's nothing to manage uh, in the streams. So you can see here that this change is pretty dramatic just as, as freezing levels rise and as the change in character of precip during warmer winters changes, um, we have this reduction in snowpack and runoff uh, across the southwest. All right. Um, and then what we see too with this increasing temperature, this was a paper out uh, a couple years ago um, using sort of tree ring reconstructions and some um, climate uh, projection data was taking this idea of if warming temperatures increases evapotranspirative demand or atmospheric demand or drying of the atmosphere, that atmospheric hunger for water, um, how does it change drought stress on trees? This was an interesting study. A lot of colleagues across Arizona and New Mexico you can see here that um, there's that 50s drought, there's the 2002 drought because it was so much warmer, had so much more evaporative stress and stress on trees, which is um, probably related to why there's such catastrophic fires that particular year. Um, we can look at these changes over time. This is 1900 all the way up through 2100, so we, we shift the projection space right about here. Humidity um, starts to decrease as we go forward, so this is vapor pressure deficit, so it's basically Increasing numbers means it's drier air, so more skin cracking air. Uh, in concert with temperature, precip is very noisy, but just taking these two things, and even with precip being noisy, you end up having um, this sort of plummeting um, and increasing drought stress on vegetation just because it's warmer, even if it's raining, because the water balance is speeding up, increasing, creating more aridity. Okay, so to wrap it up, and I'd be happy to answer any questions here. Um, we have, we're in a droughty place. So I, I was cheerleading on this El Nino event to give us just a, I just wanted a wet year, right? I moved here in, uh, in 2001, and I had heard about these fabled El Nino events, and I, I thought that I might see one in my career if I retired at U of A, and it's coming, you know, it was an 18 month event. It, it, was, it was, you know, taking its time to develop, and I had so much excitement building up to the fall um, that, and it completely let me down. So now I'm even more bullish in my idea. Well, this is a droughty place. We can't even do it during an El Nino. We've got a plan for droughts. And we, we just have to, we have to lower our expectations for climate and water here in Arizona. It just, we're built for drought. We just need to accept that. We're not gonna have any bailout years. Wet years will come along and they'll be fantastic. We should enjoy them. But the background condition for Arizona is, is definitely drought. And missing out on that El Nino precip, timing wise, um, would have been great respite, especially with some of that summer precip stacking up. A great wet winter would have been fantastic. We just didn't get it. Um, so, and a La Nina following on its heels puts us back into long-term drought um, category. So looking forward longer than this, um, the seasonal outlook points to La Nina. I think that's pretty good bet for a drier than average year. I'd rather just, I probably should just go around telling people that the winter will be dry. I'll probably on, on average be right. There's probably some, some gambling logic in here that I need to apply over the long term that my skill will be better if I just say bet on dry and then every once in a while, and then if it's, if it's wet, people will be happy rather than being disappointed. Um, and then longer term, how this sort of shift towards drought looks, it's not real clear, but it will be warm. So we have to deal with the warming temperatures that will exacerbate drought conditions or may even cause drought conditions to emerge when it's a normal year. So precip like this year, we look at October through March, like we just looked at, is near average, but the timing was poor, it was very early in the season, and it was very warm in the late part of the season. We probably are having drought impacts emerge right now that are a little bit masked by what the total precip looks like right now because of those warming temperatures as well. Okay, that's, um, that's all I got.